Greetings. I'm Bern Zampano. This is the Word of Faith Ministries International Miami Teaching of the Week. Let's pray. Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word as we empty ourselves vessels for your use. And yield now to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, the saints say in agreement, amen. Satan, we bind you, all unholy seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places, territorial uh, spirits, elemental spirits, familiar spirits, all spirits on assignment, all disembodied souls, all entities not of the Holy Spirit. All of your works and efforts, which we curse at the roots and decree of no effect, bind up and off all counterattacks, judgments, wraths, revenge, retaliations, or reprisals in any way, manner, or form to or through any individual organization, adversaries, or would be adversaries, past, present, even as they arise, or to or through anyone, anywhere, at any time, in any manner, for any reason, by any means, for any purpose, in any way, and decree all such immediately permanently and perpetually forbidden by the faith of God in Christ. Jesus' name do we decree and agree, and the saints say in agreement, Amen. Hmm. Uh, today we're going to discuss uh, a continuation of our last broadcast, which was on the Gospel of Christ the most powerful weapon of spiritual warfare in our series, The Controllers. <clears throat> and today, I want to uh, show you not only what the gospel has the power to do, for those who are alive on the earth and living out their gospel faith walk. But also what the scripture shows us about those uh, who have sinned and have uh, gone on into the afterlife is the gospel still working in their lives? Yes, it is. Can we prove it by Scripture? Yes, we can. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and the uh, proofs will uh, be readily uh, uh, presented to you today, and I believe that you will see clearly and in no uncertain terms uh, that what these uh, verses will show us is that truly in the end time the apostasy has come. And it is affecting all of the churches. But it is a prophetic sign of the end time and all prophecy must come true because it serves God's purpose. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And God's intent is to teach righteousness, to teach holiness. Not everybody achieves that in this life. In fact, most don't. Not only that, think of the millions, if not billions, of people who are born into existence walk through life never having heard the name of Jesus or knowing who he was and go on to die. And you say, well, what happens to them? Well, God covers all of the bases. <laughs> do they have accountability to God? Yes. Why do they have accountability to God? Because the scripture says in Romans chapter 1 and 2 that the uh, word of God is written on the heart of every man, their conscience bearing witness. 
Therefore, man, you are without excuse, the scripture says. So, uh, God has a divine plan. And, thank you much. And uh, we uh, want to know and ask the question today, because it has direct bearing on the gospel. And that is, what is this divine plan? Is it what the apostate and time church is teaching people? The apostasy is by definition the falling away. It is the falling away of Christians, falling away of the churches at large, uh, from the truth of the word of God as originally intended. Part of this uh, has happened because over the centuries, the Bible has been not only translated, but retranslated and retranslated and retranslated. And sometimes meanings for certain words engineered into the definitions of those words to expand uh, and or maybe even dilute the true meaning and intent of those words so that what would happen over time is that uh, what the Holy Spirit, when he authored the scripture, was trying to convey uh, became diluted. And you say, well, why did that happen, Burn? Well, it happened for one simple reason. Uh, men created man-made churches with man-made doctrines and mixed it in with the doctrines of Christ. And obviously, when they came across certain verses that did not agree with their denominational doctrines, many of them uh, adapted variations in the meanings, and some of them uh, translated according to their doctrinal upbringings. We don't translate according to doctrinal upbringings. We translate according to the laws of languages. We don't add definitions to meanings. And I'll give you a perfect example of that in uh, uh, Revelations 14.10 and again in Revelations 20.10, where it talks about the lake of fire and brimstone. And it says that those in the lake of fire and brimstone will be uh, tormented forever and ever. Well, the word ion uh, and ionios does not mean forever and ever. That's one of the terms assigned to it by translators, by scholars. It only means one thing, an age or an eon. But if you look in the dictionaries, the Bible dictionaries, the concordances and all, and you look, you look up the word ion, A-I-O-N, ion, ionios, you will see such definitions as uh, an age, eternal, eternity, world, uh, and uh, several others. And you say, well, how can something be eternal and be a world? How can something uh, be uh, eternity? That's another definition of it, eternity. And uh, still be an age. An age means a limited period of time. An eternity means forever. Not only that, ion, A-I-O-N, has a plural. And the plural is ages. 
But if it has a plural, what about those other definitions? Does eternals sound like proper grammar to you? To just give an example, eternals, worlds, Jesus came into this world. The point I'm trying to make is that when you add definitions, how can something be an age and be eternal at the same time? An age implies a time limit. And so we get into these translational difficulties because of what men have done in the handling of the word. And I'm submitting to you today that the gospel which is preached to the end time church is only partially correct. And I'm going to prove it to you uh, through scripture and through word studies. Because it's important that we not permit the power of the gospel uh, and its ability to immediately and completely take someone from the kingdom of darkness and transpose them immediately and completely into the kingdom of light, where Satan's plan for their lives stops dead immediately and God's plan for their life takes over immediately. People, when they hear a false gospel, uh, lose heart. They begin to doubt. Let me just give you a quick example of why I'm, I'm talking this way. For years and years now, we have heard part of the true gospel correctly uh, preached, I'd say, in most churches. Be saved by grace through faith. Grace is God's love and power and victory and favor and mercy to you, which you and I cannot earn or deserve. God does it because of who he is, not because of what we do. Grace by faith. Faith is trust on Christ. The words faith, believe, and trust all mean the same thing in the New Testament scripture. Trust on Christ. And so, we are saved by grace through faith. And then, an interjection comes in in the presentation of the gospel of the consequences of not walking by grace through faith or walking in sin. And it is commonly taught that some will go to heaven, some will go to hell. Again, a false doctrine. Probably the greatest heresy of the Christian faith. Why? Because it maligns the heart of the Father. And it gives a nonverbal message that the salvation of God to man is conditional or based on performance, but uh, is not the free gift. Listen, folks, a free gift is a free gift. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, It is by grace through faith 
that you are saved. That you are saved. You are saved. And that, watch this, not of your own. No effort on your part. Psalm 46.10, cease striving and know that I am God. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 continues. And that, not of your own. It is a gift of God, not of works, not of self-effort, so that no man can boast, so that no one can brag. And so we have in the end time church the continual message from the pulpits that the wages of sin is hell. Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Get your doctrine right. The wages of sin is death. But we say, yes, but those who have sinned eventually go into the lake of fire and brimstone where they burn forever and ever. Oh, there's that word. Ion Ionios again, meaning age, not forever and ever. If you had the plural of Ion Ionios, would forevers and forevers sound right to you? Grammatically correct? No. Again, problems with translation. Problems with adding definitions that don't belong there. The great Bible scholar Lewis Abbott spent 37 years, in fact, even making videos of his study of the word ion, which is translated forever and ever, uh, and its Hebrew equivalent, olam, in the uh, Hebrew. Uh, which is equally translated forever and ever, even though it also means an age. And he said in his 37 years that with reading as many books as possible as he could find in research and study, the reasonings and rationales uh, uh, in the discussions, he came to the conclusion that the word ion in the Greek in Revelations 14.10, Revelations 20.10 can mean only one thing, an age. And none of the other definitions that appear in the concordances apply. There are several other scholars who also agree, and uh, I, having studied it a number of years, also agree. So, it then makes us question what is this uh, lake of fire and brimstone in which th these folks who have lost their salvation supposedly go into forever and ever, and is it really? And I am going to say very boldly and in no uncertain terms, no, it is not correct. It's not correct doctrine. It's wrong to teach it, and it maligns the heart of the Father and the character and integrity of Father God. If it were not for ignorance, it probably would border on blasphemy. Those are strong words, but I want to demonstrate it further to you. This is something that I hold very dear. I love the gospel of Christ, and the true gospel of Christ is be saved by grace through faith. But notice what it says. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 again. 
It is by grace through faith that you are saved, but that not of your own. It didn't come from you making a decision for Christ. He said, what? Right. It's impossible to make a decision for Christ. He said, what? Yes. Burn, where did that come from? How do you know that? Well, because the Bible says so. Where in the Bible does it say that? John 6, 65. And what does it say, Burn? It says, and this is a quote of Jesus, no man can come to me unless the Father call him. Now, some of the translations say, unless it be granted by the Father. That's the King's James translation, and a very good one, by the way. No man can come to me unless it be granted by the Father. You see, it's impossible to make a decision for Christ unless the Father calls you. It's all of him and none of us. So then, who will be saved? And the answer to that is, all will be saved. And you say, well, where is that in the scripture, Burn? 1 Timothy 4.10. Consider the apostle and chief priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Now notice in that verse, that last phrase, especially those who believe, implies that he is also the Savior of unbelievers. You see, there are some people who will get saved, not in this world, but after death. Is that in the scripture? Yes, 1 Peter 4, 6. One Peter 4, 6 speaks of the salvation of the dead. And it says, For this reason was the gospel preached to the dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. That verb was, in that statement, is aorist tense, indicative mood. And that implies a continuing or continuity of action. We don't have uh, an aorist tense in the English language. And so very often uh, uh, scholars are inclined to use the past tense. Uh, because it's probably the closest to the aorist that we would have, but when it's combined with indicative mood, there is a uh, nuance and understanding of the implication of continuity. Therefore, it would be more appropriate to express that verse for this reason is the gospel preached to the dead, that they may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. See, some people are going to get saved after death. There are several born-again Christian uh, ministers who have said that They've had afterlife experiences or heaven experiences. And actually, uh, I've, I've, I think I've seen this two times now, if I recall correctly, uh, on uh, uh, one, on, I think, on television, the other on YouTube, where they said they actually saw Jesus presenting the gospel to, to them. Well, you know, <laughs> the, the more I think about that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the more uh, I think 
uh, of why Jesus would do that. Huh? Can he absolutely, unequivocally trust you or me to present the gospel to everyone? Do we do it? No. We're frail and maybe sometimes irresponsible, and we flub up, don't we? Okay? So important is the gospel as a weapon of spiritual warfare, which even in the death state, when someone just passes and comes face to face with Jesus, okay, if that gospel is not presented to them, it's possible that they could perish in their sin. So why would Jesus do something like that? See, it's logical that he would, because he's performing his word. And his word says, it is not God's will that any man perish. Then uh, uh, Ephesians one uh, eleven says, all things follow the counsel of God's will. Conclusion, therefore, no man will perish. That's a gospel in a nutshell. It is not God's will that any man perish. All things follow the counsel of God's will. Therefore, no man will perish. Disprove that. Those are the words of the Holy Spirit. Can't. So, we have to open our hearts maybe to the understanding that for centuries and centuries we have been teaching people error when it comes to salvation. Some are saved, some are damned, has been the message for probably a thousand years. Where did that come from? Well, uh, the early church fathers, uh, actually the one who brought a hell and damnation uh, teaching into the Christian faith was Augustine, uh, trying to scare people straight because of all the immorality uh, in the Roman Empire at that time. In fact, he admitted it, and there is a statement by him that's quoted on the internet, and you can probably search it out and find it. I have it still in my computer. He and some other scholars got together. Uh, they were discussing the immorality uh, and the high divorce rate in the Roman Empire, and they borrowed the doctrine of hell and damnation from the Zoroastrian religion, uh, from the uh, Egyptian mystery religions uh, and from the Greek mystery religions and put it together, uh, an amalgam of things, and it ended up being uh, that uh, if you practice sin, you go to hell. Well, if you practice sin, you will go into the lake of fire. Scripture is very clear. Those who practice murder, those who practice homosexuality, those who practice um, uh, witchcraft, etc., etc. Galatians tells us that will not enter the kingdom of God. Does that mean they're damned forever? No. Where will they go? Into the lake of fire. Will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Yes, there will. It's not going to be easy. And why and how will that be? Well, we're going to have a look at it today. And I'm going to show you, firstly, that you need to understand uh, what the Word of God says about these things, because Scripture interprets Scripture, not man. A lot of denominational theologians and Bible scholars would like to interpret according to their doctrinal upbringing or to their doctrinal theology. 
and will stand by it fiercely. I once had a discussion with a Presbyterian uh, minister, and we were talking uh, about the Presbyterian doctrine of predestination. It's a very interesting one. Uh, they believe that God created and that some people who are created uh, uh, and uh, become Christians uh, will be saved and they will go to heaven and others are predestined to go to hell. Some predestined to go to heaven, some predestined to go to hell. And I said to him, well, that sounds very strange to me. Uh, if God was going to predestine people uh, to uh, go to hell, and he's all-knowing, and he would know ahead of time that they wouldn't be saved and that they would go to hell, then why did he create them? And he says, I don't know. And I said to him, well, does that seem fair to you? And his answer to me was this. He says, uh, I don't know. God's glory comes first. Could you imagine what, what a, an amazing re response and explanation why God would predestine some to be damned forever because his glory had to come first and he had to show the power of what he could do. You see, this is the kind of trouble you get into academically, uh, the kind of doctrinal problems you get in academically when you wrongly interpret the word of God. Is predestination in the scripture? Absolutely. But the predestination in the scripture is that all are predestined to be saved. The Gospel of John says the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Let me ask you a question. Do you think he failed in his assignment? Can you answer me that? I don't. One Timothy two verse five and six says that Christ was given a ransom for all. Actually, the original Greek says the all, meaning the whole of the creation and everything in it. Christ was given a ransom for all. Do you think his ransom failed? How about uh, Luke 20, 38? In, uh, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live unto him. All live unto him. Acts 3.21 Speaking of Christ, whom the heavens must retain until the time of the restoration of all things spoken by all the prophets of old from the beginning of the age. Wow. Did you know there were prophets from the beginning of the creation of the age? We don't even know their names, who they were, where they were, what they said or taught. But they knew. And they knew that God would save all. And Acts 3.21 says, of Christ, whom the heavens must retain until the time of the restoration of all things. Now, in the original Greek, the word things is not there. It was added by man. In the original Greek, it says, until the time of the restoration of the all, meaning the whole of the creation and everything in it. Are these things really true? Yes, they are. You see, I would very clearly venture to say today, brothers and sisters, that if the apostles 
were here today and they saw the brand of Christian faith that is being practiced in the churches, they would hardly recognize it as Christian. And I feel very strongly about that. I know a lot of pastors who also feel very strongly about that. So, I want to show you God's real plan and the real gospel of Christ. And it's important that you understand it. And in order to do that, I uh, need to take you through some slides. It's a short presentation today, nowhere near like our usual ones, but, but we will have to take a little time uh, uh, making some points and pointing out the whyness of things on those slides. I think it will convict you of something new and wonderful that you never knew about the lake of fire and what it really is. It's been cloaked by religious spirits who have tried to tell people for centuries and centuries that uh, God will damn all who will not obey him. So uh, I want to get into the presentation now, uh, if we may. And then uh, I'll make a couple closing comments uh, to sort of bring this together. And by the end uh, of, the, of the presentation, when you see how God works for the sake of saving millions and billions of souls through what the true gospel is, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the all, especially those who believe. By grace through faith, correct, but the Savior of the all in the original Greek. It has to be that way. Why? The scripture tells you that every knee will bow, bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. How can every knee bow and confess their faith in Father God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit unless they were all saved? Because God is love, the scripture says. And he doesn't want it by force. Why would he want people to bow by force to do that? What, would, what kind of a... Uh, an action uh, or judgment would that be if it wasn't in their heart to do that to begin with? Because the love of Christ is an affair of the heart. You know that. I know that. And because it's an affair of the heart, and because you and I know that God wants our hearts, then he will have every knee bow, every tongue uh, confess as an action from their hearts. And that can only come by God saving all. Well, let's look at a few things. And I'm going to show you some very interesting things you didn't know before. Probably will shock some of you. Probably will upset some of you. Some of you may even take offense to what you will see in, in these translations, okay? And uh, if you take offense, uh, 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 I, I don't feel you need to, but if you do, that's okay, because God offends the mind to expose the heart. I've seen people talk, I've, even from the pulpits uh, uh, on occasion, I've seen pastors uh, with this fiery preaching talking about how some people were going to go to hell. And 
uh, have a grin on their face while they're preaching it as if they were looking forward to that. Horrible. Horrible. God is love. His love is infinite. It reflects his character in being, which is infinite. And if his love is infinite, his grace is infinite. It cannot be marginalized by some theologian somewhere or by rationalizations of men. And so, I'm going to show you today why. So, uh, can we get started, if we may? And much of what I'm going to present uh, uh, with these slides actually uh, shows the heart of Paul and what he preached. Some uh, uh, people say, Uh, well, wait a minute, uh, Byrne. Uh, you're preaching the salvation of all. Uh, you're you're preaching uh, Christian universalism. That uh, salvation will be universal for all men. Uh, that is exactly correct, with no apologies. Why? Because the because Paul, Jesus, first Paul. And all the apostles were universalists in their preaching. They preached, God will save all. You say, well, if that's really true, then what about all these verses and scriptures about damnation and eternal torment? And uh, about... Uh, uh, everlasting destruction and and uh, uh, being uh, burned in fire forever and ever. Aren't those in the scripture? Yes, they sure are. And every one of them manipulated with word substitutions uh, or uh, with uh, added definitions to the words that don't belong to the words. You say, well, how do you know that, Bern? Because I spent 13 years going through every single verse in the New Testament and Old Testament that had to do with uh, uh, judgment, damnation, eternal punishment. Looking carefully through the Hebrew and the Greek, and then going to the secular Greek dictionaries rather than the Christian uh, Bible dictionaries to find out what the culture uh, used to use those words for and how they assigned definitions to it uh, in the uh, ancient Greek culture. Because that was their language. They should know what their words meant. You see? When I when I, at first I started using the uh, Greek uh, uh, from the Bible dictionaries, concordances, this and that, I was amazed at how the definitions were the same as what the definitions uh, that they were using those words for were in the scriptures. And then I realized the reason why, because the guys who were doing the uh, translations in the scriptures were the same guys who were taking those definitions from the scriptures and writing the dictionaries and putting the same def definitions in the dictionaries. Well, that's of no help, because the, the meanings that they were putting in there were their opinion of what they believed according to their doctrinal upbringings and scholarship. But I wanted to know what did those words really mean in the ancient Greek uh, that the average Greek person uh, knew and used and expressed when they were talking. And so I would make comparisons. And through that, 
I came to an understanding of how the religious spirit had subverted the scriptures by diluting meanings or substituting them to create uh, Satan's uh, image and likeness of God for the reader of the scriptures that he, that is Satan, wanted them to have. It's a war, folks. That's all I can tell you. You either believe that this is uh, true and going on, or you don't. That's your prerogative. However, I can tell you that it is really true. And if you would like to know more about that, I invite you to go to our website at www.walkinginpower, all one word, lowercase letters, no spaces, walkinginpower.org. Go to the book section and uh, scroll up and down until you find my book, The uh, Church That Satan Built and the Bible That Satan Wrote. You say, what? Yep. And I w explain in great detail how this evolved over 1,500 or, or, or uh, uh, 600 years. And it's all documented, both with scripture and history. And uh, that book, The Church of Satan Built and the Bible that Satan Wrote, is a free download. It's a short book. It's only 90 pages or so. And it will teach you also uh, what words were substituted for the real definitions. It'll be a real eye-opener for you if you're uh, someone who thirsts for truth. Uh, so here we're looking at a verse that is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.5. And he said that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Why did he say that? Because he had, he had uh, envisioned that in the end times there would be apostasy, the falling away of the church at large from the truth of the word of God or the truths of the word of God. And indeed, in one, uh, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said that in the last days men would... Uh, have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. That's where we are today. You talk to some pastors, they don't even believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit is your personal Pentecost experience. And just as the Holy Spirit fell on Pentecost on 3,000 and released gifts, including tongues upon all of them, and established the church, if you are a member of the church and God is not a respecter of persons, you should expect to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is the original Pentecost experience. It's part of your faith walk. Otherwise, you walk through life at half power. Well, if that's what you want, It'll be very hard to be an overcomer. And who is it that inherits the kingdom? He who overcomes. So think about that, if you would. So he warns us here. We have to see things in terms of God's power, not in terms of human wisdom that tells you that God will save some and damn others. No, we are going to develop an understanding in this broadcast about God's power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, The kingdom of God comes in power and not in words. Next. Oh, I'm doing Okay. <laughs> So Acts 20:27 20, here Paul uh, sa uh, said I have not hesitated 
to proclaim to you the whole will of God. This one verse establishes that Paul believed in universal salvation. He said it. He's the one who wrote 1 Timothy 4.10. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the all, especially those who believe. And he says that is part of the whole will of God. Next. So, it, he continues in uh, 1 Corinthians 4.17, For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. These are very bold statements. Notice what he says. My way of life in Christ Jesus. In other words, I walk and I believe in everything that Christ and his Holy Spirit have revealed. And he says, it agrees with what I teach everywhere, in every church. Anywhere Paul went, he preached universal salvation. It is a doctrine of Christ. Your disbelief will not make it go away because it is forever engraved in print in the scriptures. There are over 150 scriptures uh, in the Bible that teach that God saves all. This is not a doctrine built on one or two scriptures. And here it is. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we both uh, labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So you still don't believe, huh? Let me ask you, what part of the word all don't you understand? Titus 2.11 For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. You have a problem with that? What if God wants to do that? The grace of God has appeared. God's favor and love and power and victory to all men bringing salvation to all men. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. Now, he's quoting scripture here. And the scripture warns us, do not go beyond what is written. So if God says he will bring salvation to all men, he will save all. Do not go beyond that and start talking about hell and damnation. They are not compatible. And there are verses on hell and damnation in the scriptures, particularly the New Testament, and those verses contradict 
these verses I am showing you, and Scripture cannot contradict Scripture, which tells you that someone has tampered with the Word of God. And that's exactly what happened. And I demonstrate that in great detail in uh, my book, uh, The Church That Satan Built and the Bible That Satan Wrote, which you can freely download from the book section of our website. You see, they argue... Uh, when you uh, quote 1 Timothy 4.10... Uh, Jesus Christ, the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Okay? They come at you and they say, Oh, wait a minute, Burn. That means of all men who have received Jesus. No, that's not possible. And here is the verse that shows you. John 66, John 665. This is Jesus' words himself. He said, Therefore I said unto you, No man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. So you can't tell people you've got to make uh, a, a decision for Christ. It's impossible to make a decision for Christ on your own. That's what he said. No man can come unto me. It has to be granted by the Father. So much for the argument that 1 Timothy 4.10 refers only to those who have made a decision for Christ. Not so. Actually, I told you, the word men is not in that verse. It's Jesus Christ is the Savior of the all, especially those who believe. If he's also the Savior of unbelievers, who have not believed or come to him, that would also disprove what they're saying. Next. So, then it says, he shall say, this is King James up in the upper right, he shall say unto them on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Let's look at the original Greek here uh, over to the left. Okay? And uh, these are, uh, are uh, uh, tr literal translations down here. Uh, this is the very most literal, if you have a knowledge of Greek, much of it would not make sense to you. And so, uh, here they have, uh, because of the fact that the words uh, are out of order, according to the way the grammar of the Greek and the way they spoke uh, was set up. So, they arranged uh, the words in green here so that it would flow for your understanding. And so it says, also to the ones on the left, uh, having the ones having been cursed, uh, he said, be you going from me. The ones having been cursed into the fire, the Ionian, the Ionian, the fire of ages not everlasting. The fire of ages. This is speaking of the lake of fire. Okay. Having been made ready for the adversary and the messengers of him. Now, the word agalos in the Greek means messengers. It has been anglicized to the word angels. That's why it says uh, the adversary, the devil and his angels. Okay? The proper term for angels is messengers. They're messengers of God. Notice here, 
the first thing we need to know and recognize. The Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. And in the Scripture, the Holy Spirit has said, Depart from me, you cursed, into the age-enduring fire. Okay? The fire eonian, which means of ages, or of age, of an age. The age-enduring fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Says nothing about man. The devil and his messengers, his angels. This is the word. Here it is up here, agalos, where we get angel from. So, the implication of this translation and, and of this expression is that uh, the lake of fire was never meant for man. However, by default, if men are unsaved, if men uh, uh, are caught in iniquity, the practice of sin, or those sins that will keep them out of heaven, or our seed line of Satan, who have a soul and a physical body but do not have a spirit because they were not created, excuse me, by God. They were created uh, through angelic breeding with human women. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. And through Adam and Eve through Cain. And God did not participate in that genetic biology experiment. Because if he put a spirit man in them, the spirit man lives forever. Which means God would have to uh, contend with evil forever. Which would be contrary to his word in Ecclesiastes. All things have their season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Evil has a season only like all other things. So we see that any others that would go into the lake of fire would go in uh, by default because the lake of fire is not a place of eternal damnation and torment forever and ever. It is a time-limited place of cleansing, healing, and deliverance. And I'm going to show you why momentarily. Just stick with me, please. Thank you. Okay, so let's keep going. Now, here we are in Revelations 14.10. Let's read the King James. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, if you do a word study, which I don't have here, but if you do a word study of this phrase, they will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of. Now, uh, the word here in the Greek, in or the phrase, in the presence of, literally, in the literal Greek, means face to face. In other words, Christ and the holy angels are in the lake of fire with them. What in the world would they be doing in the lake of fire with them? Well, the answer to that is only one. Ministry. So let's look at the original Greek. Okay. Let's go over here where it, it speaks. Uh, okay. Uh, they shall drink of the wrath of God poured out in the mixture of this cup of his indignation. Okay, that brings us through here. Save a little time. But let's look here. And they shall be being tormented. The actual literal, literal Greek says ordealized. They'll be put through an ordeal. In fire. 
per or puri, puris, uh, in the Greek, and sulfur, theo, or theu, in the sight of the holy messengers, the angels, and in view in the sight of the lambkin, the lamb. Now, the uh, word uh, tormented here is probably more appropriately translated tested. They will be being tested. It's a continual process. Okay? In fire and brimstone. Uh, brimstone uh, is the English word for sulfur. In the sight of the holy angels and the Lamb. Now, the word for uh, brimstone itself is a very interesting word because it means purification. It means purification. Let's go on, and then I'll talk a little more about that if we have a little time. Uh, so here we are in Revelations 20.10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented, here we are again, tormented day and night forever and ever. There's our friend of the word... Uh, ion. Here it is here. Forever and ever. For eons of the eons. Ion, Ionias, Ionian. Okay? That means an age and age. Age and age. Ages of ages. Now, I want to go back here. And I want you to look with me, if you will, at this. This is the lake of fire and brimstone, which many theologians, Bible scholars, translators, uh, etc., have traditionally said is the final place of judgment and eternal damnation and torment forever and ever. Making God into a torturer. I don't happen to believe that God has an anger problem. And that's what they make out of it. Because where would the justice be if man who went into the lake of fire forever and ever for sins committed in a brief period of time on earth, say 70 years, where in forever and ever is justice satisfied? Could you answer that for me? Of course you can't. I can't either. So, let's look at Lake of Fire and uh, brimstone or sulfur and let's really find out what this is and what the loving God of the universe is really doing with his creation. The word, word for lake is limnin. Uh, Strong's number G3041. Limnin. And it means a literal lake but it also means a safe harbor, a place of refuge, and metaphorically, a womb. A womb is a place where a new birth takes place. Huh? Then we look at the word for fire. And this is the word puros, or pur, P-U-R. G44442 and 
it's translated fire. But this is something very, very interesting. Because it is also translated lightning. Ah, as you know, when uh, Moses was up on top of Mount Sinai, there was fire and thunder and lightning on the top, huh? And who was doing that? God. And that was God fire. And anywhere in scripture where you see fire and, li and or lightning mentioned, God is involved. And what does that mean here? It means that since both fire and, and lightning are uh, translations for this uh, Greek word peros, what the Holy Spirit is telling us is this is God fire. Fire of the Holy Spirit. Fire of the Holy Spirit. Melchizedek. The Holy Spirit. Sulfur and uh, it says they will, but let's go here, where the false prophet uh, and the wild beast that is the uh, Antichrist will be ordealized, torment, tested rather day and night into the eons of eons. So, the next question is, what is sulfur? Well, sulfur uh, is translated, brimstone is translated purification. And that is uh, theu, sulfur is theu, but the root word from which this comes is the word theon, T-H-E-I-O-N. And theon means uh, divine incense, divine spirit. Ah, divine spirit? That's Holy Spirit. So the lake of fire and brimstone is the safe harbor, the place of refuge of Melchizedek and uh, of the uh, divine incense and divine spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, Theon. That's where we get the word theology from, which means the study of the things of God. Because theos means God. See? The root words of theu, okay, which means purification, are the words for God in the Greek. The, theon in theos. So the lake of fire and brimstone is the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, according to what I've read in the scriptures, is the spirit of life. But the false teaching of the end time churches is that it's a place, the, the lake of fire is a place of eternal damnation or eternal death. But eternal death or damnation would be contrary to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it cannot be a place of eternal torment and eternal death. But burn, it says in the book of Revelation, that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yes, there will. Why? The reason that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth is because of the revelations that come forth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He is like a mirror that shows every being in the lake of fire uh, exactly what they have become. And there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there is the beginning of repentance. Now wait a minute. Most of those in the lake of fire and brimstone 
never had a spirit man because they were seed line of Satan. Remember what we read in uh, Matthew uh, 19.25? It was prepared for the devil and his angels, all right, and their offspring, the Nephilim offspring, right? The Nephilim were physical men, but they were half angel, half man, because those uh, angels in uh, Genesis 6, verse 1 to 6, had, uh, uh, had intercourse with human women. And they are in the lake of fire also. But, guess what? Do you remember... Uh, in the book uh, of Acts when uh, Paul was on the road to Damascus and this flash of light came and knocked him off his horse and he fell to the ground and Jesus said Paul I have need of you and Paul gets up blind and he says who are you Lord he calls him Lord wait a minute Paul was a Kenite a Ken, the, the Kenites were descendants of Cain. The Pharisees were Kenites. All of them. Kenites. Descendants of Cain. Meaning that God never put a spirit man in them. Because they would live forever evil if they died uh, unrepentant. But they were also half seed line of Eve so they could be saved if they could overcome the strong influence of Satan. Say? So, uh, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Kenite. Uh, resisting the Holy Spirit. Didn't know Jesus. All of a sudden, this flash comes through. Hits him. Blinds him for three days. He stands up. And now, all of a sudden... He says, who are you, Lord? He has, he has spiritual knowledge. He has word of knowledge. He's baptized in the Holy Spirit, which meant that flash was the impartation of the spirit man that Paul needed for repentance. What goes on in the lake of fire, folks, is the very same thing. I'm telling you. The fire is the flash. That's why they use the word lightning with it. And everyone in it, you see, without a spirit man, which is the conscience, you can't repent. Huh? You, you can't be purified. So it's got to happen. This is a wonderful place. You see? Now, don't get me wrong, it's not Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and it's sure going to hurt <laughs> for a while. <laughs> okay? But these people are going to get saved. Christ saves all in the lake of fire. That's why he is called the Redeemer. Huh? Doesn't, doesn't uh, Hebrews say... Uh, Christ died once for all. It says actually the all. Well, if he doesn't save all, then his death was of no use or avail, was it? Because his intent was that all be saved. And that's what the scripture says. He died once for all men, once for all time, once for all sin. Very thorough. He leaves no stone unturned, folks. No stone unturned. So, lake, place of refuge, a, strong, a safe harbor, fire, lightning, the whole fire of the Holy Spirit, Melchizedek, sulfur, purification, root word, Divine incense, divine spirit. And as we know, incense is uh, uh, praying in the spirit going up 
uh, Christ praying for us in the Spirit to the Father. That's why uh, both definitions are used here. Okay? And it'll be for ages and ages. Let's look at these individual words. You're going to find this very uh, interesting. Lake is the word limen, or limnen, as some write it. It's pronounced limain. And it means a harbor, a haven. Okay? This is from the... Uh, uh, dictionary of uh, Strong's Numbers. The, uh, the Bible, uh, uh, the main words of the Bible all have been assigned numbers in both the Greek and the Hebrew so that uh, 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 when a discussion uh, is made of a certain word or something like that among scholars, uh, they'll all check the uh, number to be sure they're all talking about the same word. It eliminates confusion, maintains accuracy. So even here in Strong's Dictionary Numbers, it, it confirms that a limnin lake means a harbor, a haven. A haven in English is a place of refuge. Another word for haven is a place of refuge. Now, the root word, limne, here, uh, actually uh, implies a lake or a pond. A lake or a pond. In this, uh, because we know that the Holy Spirit used the word lake uh, in this sense, uh, the word lake is applied. And here is uh, that word again from another source. Uh, and uh, let me just look at that for a moment. Okay, that's uh, uh, the Greek lexicon. And... Uh, And uh, this is uh, 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 Lee Main again, okay? And they translated it also a harbor or a haven, a place of refuge. So they teach uh, er in error that the lake of fire is a place of eternal torment and damnation, but here their very own books their very own uh, dictionaries tell you that the word for lake is a safe harbor, a place of refuge. And I've shown you two distinct different sources that say the same thing. Okay? And here's uh, the word per, P-U-R. Per peros. And this, by definition, has been called fire, heat of the sun, lightning. We said that. Figuratively, it's been used for strife and trials in common language. But also eternal fire, Holy Spirit, Melchizedek. And this has been a traditional meaning for the translation of per traditional fire okay or eternal fire rather eternal fire here's another source it says the same thing it's pronounced poor p o o r and they give the translation fire or fiery fire Eternal fire. Now, here's the Greek number 4442. Okay? And it is used for fire, 
or fire, but in Strong's definition, he's the uh, scholar who originally numbered all the words of the Bible uh, that uh, were main words. Okay? And in his definition, uh, you will notice that fire is put in quotes, meaning that it's not just uh, literal but figurative. Not just figurative but literal, okay, referring specifically to lightning, and these are terminologies, uh, fire and lightning always associated with the Holy Spirit. Melchizedek. And then we have the last lake of fire and here's brimstone. And this word study shows us the Greek uh, for, uh, brims, uh, translated for brimstone, theon. Theon. Okay. And it uh, at literally means sulfur but look at what its true definition of brimstone as it was used at that at, in that time divine incense regarded as having the power to purify and to ward off disease now there are some bible dictionaries that also add divine spirit here at the end and that is correct divine spirit yes so theon which would be the root word here literally means divine spirit or divine incense here's an interesting thing let me go back here a minute I want to show you something did you notice here when we were talking about fire that Strong's number is G, Greek 4442. Okay? For fire. It's fire of the Holy Spirit. G, 4442. Who's the Holy Spirit? Melchizedek. Right? Now watch this. Very interesting. So in the Greek, the word for fire, lake of fire and brimstone, is G, 4442. Meaning the Holy Spirit. And then we go down to, let's go to the Hebrew. H4442. And in the Hebrew, what does it stand for? Melchizedek. 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 The same number <laughs> in the Hebrew as in the Greek of the New Testament. You think the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you something? The lake of fire is Melchizedek, the Holy Spirit. And it's confirmed even in the word studies here. And here are some scholar confirmations. This is uh, from uh, uh, W.B. Uh, Warfield and here is what he says to, to, to theon means that which is divine so brimstone the lake of fire and brimstone brimstone theon means that which is divine the Holy Spirit concretely or shortly the deity God the Holy Spirit among the Greeks, it was consi in consistent use in the sense of divine being. And we do see that in some of the dictionaries. And particularly as a general term to designate the deity apart from the reference to a particular God with a small g. It is used by Paul in an address made to a heathen audience and is inserted into a context in which it is flanked by the simple term God with a capital G. So, theon means that which is divine, concretely or shortly, the deity or God. The lake of fire and brimstone is God the Holy Spirit. 
Now here's an interesting uh, side light uh, to that uh, made in another, uh, uh, by another commentator. Of course Theon does not stand isolated, but closely with it is fire and pool, or lake. Actually, the whole scene is described as a pool of fire and brimstone. Firstly note that brimstone alone is not a cleansing offering, but burning brimstone is. So, it is God and the brimstone burning in the lake of fire uh, which is the fire, the zeal of the Holy Spirit, is an offering to God on behalf of those who are in the fire. Secondly, if we want to see what a symbol means, we should check the usage firstly in Scripture and then also elsewhere if necessary. If the Scriptures don't clarify the meaning through usage, we could check how other authors use the word and what the word's meanings is as defined by its usage. So, we see that in the rest of scripture, fire is a representation of God. So that verb per in the Greek was Melchizedek. And that H4442 in the Hebrew is Melchizedek. The same word applying that this is the Holy Spirit that is the lake of fire. His guidance and protection, his purging and his cleansing, his power and his might refer to Moses in the burning bush, the pillar of fire going before the Israelites in the desert. This section about purification in Jeremiah, the fire from heaven in Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal and many more. Satan never comes in fire and smoke in scripture. God does, however. So here we have Theon, brimstone, okay, meaning sulfur and brimstone. But look, Theos, one, uh, one of its uh, root derivations, means godlike, divine godhead. How about that? There it is. The lake of fire is divinity. Divine Godhead. And actually, one of the variations uh, uh, here, Theos, actually means supreme divinity. Now you understand why Paul, see what am I doing? I'm letting scripture interpret scripture. This way you cannot get into doctrinal trouble. Hebrews 12, 29. Now you know why God says, for our God is a consuming fire. God is the lake of fire. It is literally true when he's saying this. He is a consuming fire which means that in the lake of fire he consumes out of every fallen being all that is incompatible with uh, the spirit's character, will, and nature and leaves on fire all that is. So in 1 Corinthians 3.15 we read, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. What? Yet so as by fire. He will be saved, yet so as by fire. There it is. It doesn't say he will be saved by fire as by fire. Because the fire is the fire of the Holy Spirit, not physical fire. And I'll tell you why shortly. 
A man's works may be burned, he may suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Luke 20, 38, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. All includes those in the lake of fire. 1 Timothy 2, 5, 6, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. A ransom for all. And you and I know his ransom did not fail. All are saved in God's timing. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Not some, all. Now I got to tell you something, folks. If some go on to eternal damnation, the Holy Spirit made a mistake when he dictated this verse and he is now obligated to rewrite it. And it must read, if some are lost to damnation, it has to read now, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ some shall be saved and the rest go on to damnation. Does it say that? No. But if it said that, and you believe that's, that people go on to be damned, this has to be, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ some shall be saved, and, and, all, and most go on to damnation. So watch this. So in Adam all die, meaning that Adam and Satan's work of sin is 100% effective, but in Christ, some are saved, and the rest go on to damnation. So Christ's work of redemption is, say, 40% effective, and 60% go on to damnation. And this is what the church preaches from the pulpits, that some are going to be damned. So Adam in Satan's work of sin is 100% effective. Christ's work of redemption is may be 40-50% effective. The rest go on to damnation. So the, per, the, per, the, ch the church is preaching Adam and Satan win out. That's what they're preaching from the pulpits. Watch this. I love this one. 1 Corinthians 15-28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Did I hear that right? That God may be all in all. If some go on to damnation, the Holy Spirit has to rewrite this too. It'll have to be, well, they go to damnation, so God may be all in some. Is that what it says? No. God will be all in all. Now, you unbelievers who are listening, what part of the word all don't you understand? <laughs> I'm having some fun here. <laughs> uh, okay, so all in all, that's God's intent. Now, do you know what this means? God may be all in all. It tells you the ministry of Melchizedek, the Holy Spirit. His ministry is to bring the whole of the creation and everything in it into the unity and fellowship of the Son of God. Woo! I'm feeling the presence right now. I don't know about you. The purpose and ministry of Melchizedek is to bring the whole of the creation into the unity and fellowship of the Son of God. I just want to uh, uh, make a few comments. 
Listen, folks, we need to get serious about policing doctrine. Otherwise, we are maligning the heart of the Father without knowing it. Doesn't the parable of the shepherd and the lost sheep tell you God's heart? What, it says, what shepherd, if he lose a sheep, will not leave the 99 to go after the one? What is the message? The message is 99% is not enough for God. He has to have 100%. All of uh, the uh, 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 verses that have to do with God's love, with Melchizedek, with the lake of fire and brimstone, etc., etc., prove over and over again that God saves all, that He may be all in all, that in Christ all are made alive, that God is not the God of the dead but of the living, for all live unto Him. Because he was given a ransom for all. You could go on and on. There's over 150 verses in scripture. Both Old Testament and New. This is the Christ of the scripture. The ultimate proof. that uh, God does not burn people in hellfire is one single verse of scripture. In Jeremiah 32 verse 35. You need to study and read it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Until the truth of that one verse gets into your spirit. And so you can accept it. Because we have been taught wrongly by man with a little help of religious spirits. Listen to what God said to the prophet in Jeremiah 32:35. He was telling the prophet about how the, the, the Israelites were sacrificing their children to the demon god, small g, Moloch. And he said some incredible things. God sat back and he watched and he said to Jeremiah, they cause their children to walk in the fire. He said, Some, listen to the words, something that never entered my mind that they should do. And he continued, it is abomination to me and it is sin. Wow. That's what God said to Jeremiah when you put people in fire or burn people to death. It is sin. Listen to what he said, the points he made to Jeremiah. He said when he saw children being sacrificed in fire, he said, number one, putting, in, putting people in fire never entered my mind. This is God speaking. He's the author of the scripture. In fact, the author is the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. He said, when you put people in fire, it never entered my mind that they should do such a thing. He said, it is abomination to me. And he said, it is sin. Three things God said about that. 
And yet, the end time church in its apostasy will say, or preach anyway, that after death, if someone dies in sin, uh, and they didn't make a decision for Christ, they will, that God, God will burn them in fire for eternity, forever. As if God had an anger problem. Can you imagine? What is the message? The message is, oh, well, uh, yes, when they're alive on earth, if God uh, saw something like that, he would say it's abomination, it's sin, never entered his mind. But after they're dead uh, in the lake of fire in brimstone, he will do things like that. He will punish forever and ever. And they preach it. Right? But God says, I change not. So if uh, they preach that as a truth, they are making God out to, number one, uh, doing something that, said he never, uh, said that he said never entered his mind. Number two, making God commit abomination. And number three, uh, making God sin. I mean, is this bizarre or is this bizarre? This is not the God of the Bible that is being preached in the end time churches. This is false doctrine, it is heresy, and it is the true gospel of Christ that frees men's hearts and their minds and their souls by knowing the truth and the love of the God of the universe who is so in love with his creation, both the fallen and the righteous, that he's willing to save all. The power of the gospel of Christ like you have never seen it before. The power of the love of God as you have never seen it before. The message that God will not give up on you. No matter how bad you are. No matter how much you've sinned. How addicted you are to this or that. Or what you have done. There is no pit so deep that God cannot reach down and lift you out. And bring you through saving grace. Infinite grace, infinite mercy, infinite compassion, because he is infinite and all of the things that he is have to reflect his infinite being. Common sense. Maybe there's some out there that don't like this. I'm sorry. It is what it is. It's God's way or no way. That's all there is. And it's a beautiful thing. Because we have a beautiful God. We have a loving God who is in love with his creation and his universe. You say, Burn, do you mean to tell me that he's going to save us. You mean he's going to save Satan? He's going to save fallen angels? After all that they've done to me? <laughs> I knew of someone who asked me that question once before. <laughs> Nora. <laughs> and, and you know what I said to her? <laughs> Can I share it? Yeah. I... I <laughs> I said to her, Nara, you have to understand how God thinks about sin. His tolerance of sin is zero. Zero. So, here you have Satan with 
800 million quintillion quadzillion sins on himself. And here is Nora with one sin, a lie, and nothing else. Just one sin, a lie. God's tolerance of sin is zero. So God would say, you're in his camp. Ooh, right. Sin is sin. So God would say, you're in his camp. So if I should save you, why shouldn't I save him? See? And you say, but where is the justice and the judgment of God in all of this burn? You're glossing over it. No, I'm not. You see, we have uh, people who have the idea that God has to damn, God has to burn forever and ever and ever because it's part of his justice. It's part of his judgment. He's made judgments. He has to carry them out. There's one problem. Those judgments aren't in the scripture. You say, what do you mean they're not in the scripture? Just what I said, they're not in the scripture. You see, the theologians, or many theologians, not all, but many, many uh, who uh, uh, are Bible scholars and uh, translators and all others, pastors, have the idea that uh, the wages of sin is damnation. The wages of sin is hell. No, the wages of sin is death. You got your doctrine wrong. That's number one. Number Point number two. They teach that God's judgment is unto damnation. Again, wrong. The Bible doesn't say that. Let me just give it to you in a nutshell. Isaiah 26, 9 says, When your judgments are in the earth, O Lord, the inhabitants of the earth will learn righteousness. That very same verse in the Septuagint translation, the Old Testament in Greek, which was the only translation that Jesus and the apostles and Paul preached from and quoted the scripture from, they would not use any pre-Masoretic texts uh, of uh, the Masorite scribes who were the scribes of the Pharisees uh, for obvious reasons. They were the enemies of Jesus and they were watering down the Messianic prophecy so people could not recognize that it was Jesus and he wouldn't use theirs. He used only the Septuagint translation. And in the Septuagint, that same verse, Isaiah 26, 9, when your judgments are in the earth, O Lord, the inhabitants of the earth shall learn righteousness. Okay? In the Septuagint, they add to it. They say, as a light, when your judgments are in the earth, O Lord, the inhabitants of the earth shall will learn righteousness. What's the difference? The one, the Septuagint translation was written by uh, uh, Levite priest scribes who were in covenant with God and appointed to make translations. The first one, that's uh, the one that I quote is from all of our present day Old Testaments, which is Masoretic text, and the Masorites are the or were the scribes of the Pharisees, the enemies of Jesus. They took out as a light, as a revelation. And they just said, when your judgments are in the earth, O Lord, the inhabitants of the earth will learn righteousness. Okay? But notice in the two translations, one, judgment is unto righteousness in the Septuagint. 
judgment is unto righteousness and revelation. And then in Isaiah 44, verse 2 and 3, it says, judgment is unto truth. Oh, wait a minute. The Bible doesn't say judgment is unto da eternal damnation. I'm sorry, it's not there. It does not say judgment is unto eternal damnation. It says judgment is unto revelation. Judgment is unto truth. Judgment is unto righteousness. Learning righteousness. What is it that the Holy Spirit does and works in them in the lake of fire no matter how long they have to be there? They're learning righteousness. Judgment is unto righteousness. Learning righteousness. So, for some it might be ages and ages. That's a very, very long time. You see, if you have Jesus Christ and the gospel as uh, and the fullness of the gospel as your personal Lord and Savior and the message to hold on to. If you die, you go immediately from uh, earthly life into kingdom life, Zoe life. Right to heaven in the presence of the Lord. But if you don't have a Savior to pay for your sins for you, trusting on Him and loving Him, and having a depth of gratitude for what He did for you. You see, it was you and me that were supposed to be hanging on that cross, and He went for us. He was not guilty of anything. He was an innocent man. But He said, I lay my life down of my own accord. He agreed with the Father to take all sin of all men upon himself and pay the price for everyone's sin, yours and mine included, so that we could have eternal life with him in the kingdom of God forever. That's the deal. A changed life for an exchanged life. Jesus said, you give me your life, I'll give you my life with all of its benefits. Wow, what a deal. And he does it for the asking. So that you go immediately from earthly life to kingdom life. But watch this. If you don't have a say, and by the way, Isaiah calls that the straight highway in the book of Isaiah. But Isaiah also talks about the crooked highway. The prophet said that there was a crooked highway that leads to nowhere. The end of which is not pleasant. Because there will be the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So... What is the crooked highway? The crooked highway is the highway people walk when they do not have a savior. Now watch this. It's really important that you understand. If you do not have a savior and you die in sin, You will have to go into the lake of fire where you will have to pay for every sin you ever committed, working it out with the Holy Spirit in repentance, one by one, one by one. Why? Because the lake of fire and brimstone does uh, not operate by grace. It operates by law because you did not have a savior to take your sins for you, right? Today, why 
uh, is it uh, that there are so many people uh, who uh, rejected Christ and can't understand why they can't find Christ because of the fact, and this is particularly true, uh, why did the Jews, for instance, reject Messiah when he came? Well, they had an idea that it was going to be a political Messiah and not a, a spiritual Messiah. And so they turned from Jesus. Okay, will they be saved? Yes. Will they come to know him? They're already coming to know him. They're testifying that they're having experiences of him. See, it's self-proving. But my point to you is this. If you go in the lake of fire, you've had no Messiah. Messiah will be in the lake of fire uh, with the uh, ministering angels with you to work things out. But it may take uh, an eon, two eons, who knows? I don't, we don't know. But it says it's a very long time. A very long time. We don't know. Why? Because you didn't have a Savior. So now, either you have to get a Savior in the lake of fire, or according to the law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you're going to pay for your own sins on your own if you don't want Jesus. So uh, it will be a very, very long time. The scripture says you'll be tested for ages and ages. Now notice, uh, it, it does also say, I believe it's in Revelation 14.10, that they'll be tested day and night, which means that day and night refers to physical existence. The lake of fire in brimstone is somewhere in the physical universe. Day and night implies physical existence. Now, that being the case, eon or eons has even more of a significance. Because if eon or eons is a physical, ex uh, is a, in a physical existence, you ask a geologist, how long is an eon or an age? You know what he'll tell you? Five billion years. And notice what the scripture says. They will be tested for ages and ages. Which means a minimum of 10 billion years and a minimum of 10 billion years more because ages is at least two, to be plural, right? So you're talking about the possibility of being 20 billion years in the lake of fire before you go up off the shore to the other side when Jesus gives you a new name and a new identity. And it can all be avoided by understanding that we are all sinners and every sinner needs a savior and you need a savior too and you need him right now. Tomorrow may be too late, you don't know. So, how about it? Can we make a decision now? The Father's calling you, I know it. Pray this prayer with me aloud, won't you? Being willing to turn from your sin. And I'll tell you what to do after. Just say these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Every sinner needs a Savior. I need a Savior. I'm sorry for my sins. I surrender them to you. And I ask you to come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. That is, lead me through life. And, uh, and save me. Be my Lord. Lead me through life. I receive you by a trusting faith. On you alone for my salvation. And I thank you. For the free gift of eternal life. Which I cannot earn or deserve. But I thank you anyway. I 
trust on you for my salvation. Come into me now, Lord Jesus Christ, and live big in me. I give you thanks. I give you praise. I give you glory. Now, if you prayed that prayer, get yourself into a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational church. Get water baptized by immersion. Get Holy Spirit baptized, the Pentecost experience, uh, from someone in your congregation who may have the baptism in the Spirit. If there are none, go to the New Testament Gospel of Luke chapter 11. Read it slowly to understand without doubting. Ask Father God to baptize you in his Holy Spirit and he will do so for the asking. Get into Christian community where they can teach you the word of God. I promise you, my friends, you'll never again be the same because the proof that Jesus Christ is real is the testimony of changed lives by the hundreds of millions of those who have received him throughout the centuries. It is self-proving. As a matter of fact, one of the promises Jesus gives of those who uh, uh, accept him as Lord and Savior, he says in the Gospel of John, I will manifest myself to them. So you will get a direct experience of Jesus and you will know that you know that you know that it was he who was present and did it when he did it. It's self-proving. It's experiential. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for listening. God bless you. Have a great week now. Bye-bye.